Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to the eighth episode of the Future Worlds Metaverse podcast. We have a very special guest today. It is Matthew Nuzareth, who's the U.S. CEO from the Sandbox, which is one of the preeminent decentralized virtual lands. And I'm sure Matthew will get into that in a second. Um, I want to let you also know he's going to be at our Future Worlds Metaverse conference tomorrow, November 12th in Los Angeles. If you want to come out and see him or ask him any questions or follow on to this conversation, I think his panel's at 10 a.m. I think I'm moderating his panel. So feel free to come out. It's www.futureworlds.co for any tickets or information. Let's jump in. Matthew, very good to have you today. Hi, C. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Um, it looks from your background, just a quick little bit of research, you are very much a serial entrepreneur. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. I've, I've built five companies over the past 27 years or so. I'm an OG of um, um, uh, uh, startup, you know, creating and 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 managing and, and selling at the end of the day. And you came through it. Did you come through crypto, or were were you on the marketing side, or how did you get into this? Uh, I've been in the I've I've been building video game companies for a while now since 2000, so that's 22 years. And I really started to be very very involved in crypto in 2017. I start I co-founded a Bitcoin mining company and. Also on a personal level, I started to invest and I really, you know, I started to be passionate about the, the space. So it's just the combination of the two and, and I ended up at the sandbox. It's it's amazing. And, and the more I learn about the space, because it's it's still relatively new on the metaverse side, the gaming side has been around for a while, but it seems like gaming was ahead because one, they've got the eyeballs and they've been in it for a long time. And two, they've got the technology, right? You've got Unity, you've got these engines Unreal that are pushing high bandwidth, high volume graphics, motion, animation, all that kind of stuff. And it seems like the Central End and the Sandbox and Upland, all the other decentralized projects seem to have less resolution and less eyeballs at this point. I think that's changing. But how do you see that? Is that, do you think there's going to be a, a, a gaming's going to morph more into this or the or the other lands are going to be become more gamified i mean sandbox is very gamified right now right i mean sandbox is 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 uh uh um originally a game you know we've we've been building games for the past 10 years now and and the sandbox as we know it is really uh started in 2018 and that's also what really sets us apart from other web 3 metaverses like the central end for example with much more games that we have Everything that a game has, including you know challenges and quests and leaderboards and competition, this kind of thing. So and and it, it, we believe that's really really important to attract uh, users into the metaverse. The gaming aspect is really key to attract them, retain them, and eventually also monetize. So how do you set yourself up against a Roblox or against an Epi you know a, a Fortnite? Someone that's already basically fully gaming. Yes, and they're starting to they're starting to move into retail. You're seeing them with concerts and entertainment products. How does yeah. that work against you guys? So first of all, you know we're uh, very impressed with the the success of Roblox and and Fortnite and, or even Minecraft and others. I mean they've they've, they've been building Web two metaverse for a while. They've been you know uh, they've built a moat uh, and and very good product. Uh, we are pretty wet three so we come from a different angle we think that those guys are going to have a very hard time moving to a web three um uh, parading or web three engine if you will and the big difference between web two metaverse and web three metaverse is the in web three you have creators really have the digital ownership of what they create as opposed to web two and if you you know create content for uh, Roblox, or if you create content for Fortnite, at the end of the day, it really doesn't belong to you. You can make some money, uh, but they, the big platform, the big tech, they decide what they, you know, what they're going to end up doing with with your content. With Web three metaverse like ourselves, uh, uh, the, the the digital ownership is really baked in. It's really uh, a part of our DNA. That's part of the product, um, and as a result. The, our tech rate, our commission is only 5%. So we give back 95% uh, uh, to the creators of everything they monetize on, on the sandbox, as opposed to way, way, way uh, less on, on on other platforms. So that's interesting. I want to get to the governance in a second, because I think the, the, the centralized um, system is also very interesting. But you're right, on the monetization side, 
there's a big advantage. Like you said, if someone wants to create something and have the rights to that, and like you said, if, you're, if your take is only 5%, um, there's a lot of incentive for creators to come on these platforms and create as much as many digital goods as possible and then promote yeah. them within the platform. Do you see cross-platform pollination happening yet or is that still a ways away? That, I mean, that's another, you know, uh, benefits of Web3 Metaverse is uh, the uh, interoperability nature of the, the content being built um, on, on those Web3 Metaverse. So in theory, you could, because NFTs, everything in the sandbox is an NFT, including the land, including the items you buy, the props, the cosmetic characters, I mean, the avatars. And the the because it's based on NFT, you could, you know, take because you have ownership of those of this content you can take it with you and use it into another metaverse including a competing metaverse um in practice in practice it's a, it's a bit more difficult because it would it would require the other metaverse to render it from a graphical you know graphic and and um, uh, fun uh, functionality perspective they would have to do the effort of you know rendering it but the property really goes away goes comes with you wherever you go and that's really a fundamental difference between Web3 and Web2. Uh, Web2 is very much siloed. Uh, I don't think you can use uh, a Roblox avatar into Fortnite or or the other way around. Whereas in Web3, you, you can, or you could or you can. I mean, for example, in the sandbox, we've worked with other NFT projects, other Web3 projects, and we made the effort of rendering what were collectible 2d collectibles we turn them into 3d avatars for example so it's work on our side but as soon as you log into your sandbox account if you have one of these collectible on your wallet automatically you have a, a, a 3d avatar uh, from it and, and that's really a fundamental difference web3 is it's not a zero-sum game so the more you work with others, including competitors, I think the more value it creates for everybody, as opposed to Web2 to Zero. Web2 is very much a, a zero-sum game. And I come from Web2, you know, I've done mobile gaming for, for a long, long time, and it's very much a zero-sum game. So that's a pretty fundamental difference. How long do you think until you see that mass exodus from a Web2 gaming platform to a Web3 virtual lands platform? Or will there always be people that keep you know, one leg in each in each type. Yeah, I, I don't think we will. We are not here to kill Web two. I think you know, uh, uh, my 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 view is that Web two will you know sustain uh, or keep having a very a very good business for a long uh, for a long time. They probably explosive growth is behind behind them right now. They're going to reach a plateau and they're going to make money and they're going to thrive and survive. Uh, uh, and we're not trying to replace those guys. We try to bring something else something it's in addition uh and right now we are you know smaller than web2 companies uh, i think roblox has 250 million monthly active users probably tens of millions of daily active users we are we just finished our uh, finish our uh, alpha season three a few days ago <coughs> and we had we have about 4.5 million wallets or accounts created in, in on the sandbox so we are smaller but we're growing much faster um uh and um and also the monetization is higher per user than, than on, on, on Web2 Metaverse. It's almost like Amazon, what they did to the publishing business and books, right? I, I remember when people were getting book deals through Simon & Schuster or Penguin or Random House, and you get a relatively big advance, maybe a $100,000 advance. <laughs> but until you recoup that, which usually was never for, for most authors, you would get, you know, nothing. nothing. And then if you yeah. recouped it, you'd get a penny a book as a royalty. Whereas if you put your book up on Amazon, you didn't have the cachet of being a random house published author. And maybe your book wouldn't be in Barnes and Noble, which, you know, those, those physical stores are going away, but you could make 10 or $15 a book, right? So it wasn't about the, the advance, which I think suckered a lot of people into that model, but it yeah. was create what you want and make the money that you're getting from selling it and marketing it almost yourself. Yeah. So do you think there will be, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you'd say yes, but third party companies will help people market and promote their goods. So if you build, you know, a, a, an avatar clothing line or a vehicle or something that's useful, do you see a place where, or I don't know if there are any right now, that people will come in as a third party marketing company and say, I will help spread this and promote this over, 
you know, two months or three months and then take a piece of that profit? Is that a viable business? Definitely. And, and, and beyond this, we hope and we think we're going to create millions of digital jobs that don't even exist today. Maybe you'll be a digital gardener or maybe you'll be a virtual host, you know, greeting people. Or maybe you have, we're based on the concept of we have virtual lands. We have a finite amount of land that people buy, but maybe you're just a landowner and you have, uh, you work with a content creator who's going to rent your land, maybe for a month, maybe for a year. Uh, I think we, we're really building an ecosystem of, of, uh, um, of really it's a new economic uh, environment, new economic activity. Uh, and we believe we we're gonna have millions of people doing different kinds of jobs. We're not, we're just a platform. So we're just providing the tools and then it's up for, for, for others to you know come in and set up shop in, on the sandbox. And I think you're limited to 166,000 some odd yes. parcels. Yeah. yeah. Why, why that number? Why, why did you pick that number? I don't know if there was a reason for that number. We wanted a finite amount of uh, a finite amount of land, uh, and every parcel, seen from a human avatar perspective, is about two point five acres. Gives an idea of you know how, how big they are. All together, if you put all these parcels together, we're about the size of Los Angeles, and we wanted to be the way we think about the sandbox. Or we, if I take a step back, we believe in a multi metaverse world. So I was mentioning interoperability. We want people to go from one metaverse to the other, uh, uh, but also we have, you know, we are ambitious. We want to, we want to succeed. We are right now the, the biggest and probably the most successful Web three metaverse. Uh, and 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 uh, in the future, our ambition is to be the most exciting, uh, uh, the most exciting place. And we view ourselves, if we were to compare it to something in the real world, think of us of the sandbox as as a big city like Los Angeles and London and New York and Tokyo, these kind of things where we create like a critical mass of, you know, uh, a culture and economic activity, uh, uh, big brands and big celebrities coming in. And I noticed I was just looking at Sandbox. I see, you know, Warner Brothers, number one, that was probably the biggest logo I could see and Atari and Binance and a number of large brands and large media companies. Um, what's to prevent them from scooping up all the parcels. Is, there must be some type of governance or framework saying you can't expand. I mean, Warner Brothers, you know, I'm sure they'd buy as many parcels as they could, but what's, what are the restrictions on, on, you know, say corporations and brands buying up huge chunks and limiting, you know, actual. Yeah. Value? So we, we, we have two ways to sell the other parcels. The first one is we call this uh, primary sale. And we've, we sold two thirds of the 166,000 in two years. Uh, we've decided to become very, uh, you know, uh, conservative when selling land. Now we're only selling maybe a few hundred per month, so it's going to take another two or three years until we we sell the whole, uh, the whole world. Um, we try. I mean, it, it's it's a marketplace out there. So we sell we sell the the land, you know, on primary, and as soon as it's sold, then because it's based on an NFT, you can find them on OpenSea, for example, which is a big NFT marketplace, and anyone can buy and trade and sell. Uh, so we don't have limitation. It turns out that today we have a very good mix of big brands, big corporations, but also a lot of individuals, small companies, medium companies. Uh, I think it turns out to be, I don't know why, it's just uh, turned out to be a good mix of different company size and individuals, actually. You've done a good job curating. I'm just wondering if there's something, like you said, if this is going to be the the Los Angeles or New York, and it's filled with skyscrapers, and then you'll have other metaverses that maybe aren't New York. Um, is that is there a restriction? I'm sure there's somewhere in the governance, but it, 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 the deepest pocket would come in and buy up as much space as they could, right? I mean, in, in we, we have. I mean, yes, but also those people they know that in order for this land to succeed or for their land that they buy to gain value long-term, they need diversity. They can't, it can't just be big corporation. It has to also attract individuals, has to attract celebrities, artists, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. And, and, and if you look at Los Angeles or New York, it's, it's not just corporation. You have, uh, uh, you need diversity in, in uh, bringing all those people. So I think, they know, imagine if, if a big corporation buy all of the land, then it's, it, it doesn't be, instead of becoming a city, it becomes a, uh, it becomes like a, a Disneyland. And it's, it's a bit different, right? It's, it's a theme park. And I think there is a big difference between a theme park 
and a city. A, a city is very much organic. Uh, you have some governance, of course, but it, it's really the people coming in a city that create value as opposed to a theme park where it's one corporation, you know, managing it all. That's a good point. Like a company town. I mean, there used to be those, there still are in some areas, but like a, you know, Boeing would come into an area and say, we're going to have aircraft manufacturing and they would buy up all the land, put in little houses, all the engineers and, and designers and builders would live in those houses and Boeing would control the town. But I, I, you're right there. You have to maintain a consumer base. Otherwise who's going to buy the products and come yeah. see. So yeah. it's important to keep that. Um, I'm just wondering if someone comes in and buys up and then says, we're going to resell the land at a profit on our terms. Um, like you said, Disney, you know how Disney does that in Florida, right? They have a, I think it's called Celebration City. They actually built residential cities that you could buy houses and condos in, but it's still on Disneyland next yeah. to Disney World, which mm -hmm. kind of a weird, it's kind of weird. I mean, it's fine. We just want to be, we'd rather be Los Angeles than, than this thing. Uh, uh, I think it's it's more interesting. It's more exciting. And I think eventually it's going to create more value for, for the landowners and, and, and the people living there. Let's talk about zoning, because I think that's an issue that I've uh, no one's given me a straight answer on before. And I know, you know, I, living in Los Angeles, there's a lot of zoning issues. You can't put a fence up. You can't put a swimming pool in. There's so many things you cannot do with your land. Are you guys developing structures or laws or regulations saying you can't put a, a bar next to a school or a store next to a meditation center? What's how does that work within Sandbox? So we don't have this. I mean, we have some regulation. For example, you cannot build like too high because we don't want people to buy a small piece of land and then have a 10 mile skyscraper, a 10 mile high skyscraper. It wouldn't make sense. Uh, uh, but other than that, we are, I mean, there is always this tension between being fully decentralized and people can do whatever they want and also being fully in control. So we try to be somewhere in between. Uh, uh, we try to create neighborhoods uh, it's coming. We have we haven't a lot yet, but uh, it's really coming, and you'll see announcements coming soon. Uh, some will be more about entertainment. Some will be more about technology, or some will be more about music, for example. Uh, it's something we do, but then, yeah, we wanna we wanna have you know we want this to be organic, uh, and and people you know decide where they want to live and where they want to build on 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 the sandbox. So let's get into the governance because that that is I think you know it's it's a big point of conversation. I had a conversation with Sherry Hugh, who runs a, a site called Water and Music. She's a very big music blogger and super deep on data and research. And she was talking about how descent, you know, DAO structures, decentralized structures. And then I asked her, I said, but your company isn't decentralized. And she said, no, it'd be very difficult to run our company in a decentralized fashion. I said, so how are you going to run a world or a land decentralized. So how does it work with you guys? Is it the most, uh, your currency is sand, the most token holders have the largest votes or is there something else at play? So we view decentralization as it's not black and white for us. It's more a spectrum. Um, and, and some companies like web two companies, if you were, if you were to have a, a, you know, scale from zero to 10, some companies like Roblox or Minecraft or Fortnite, they're at zero, right? Almost. Uh, some companies, if you look at the, our, you know, another web three metaverse like Decentraland, for example, decided to go all the way to ten or even eleven. They even dissolved the company that created the the space. They don't have a CEO anymore. They just have a foundation. Every single one uh, uh, with the community. And if you want to make an improvement to Decentraland, you just have to submit a proposal, people vote, then it's implemented and so on. The sandbox, we are somewhere in between and part of our business is decentralized, but part of it is still very much centralized. So yeah, we still have a company, we have a CEO, we have management team, we have offices, we have investors and so on. It's just that over time we'll you know, tend towards more decentralization. So right now the governance is made by us, but part of our business, like the sand token, for example, is, is completely uh, uh, supply and demand. The land sales, so supply and demand, people can build whatever they want. So this is really decentralized that. Uh, and you'll see over time, we'll also make an announcement where, you know, little by little, we will decentralize our own uh, uh, corporation, but it's going to take time. And we think now it's it's a good balance between between the two. So if you were a betting person, would you say it's smarter to, I guess, again, I know what you're going to say, smarter to buy in now 
while it's a little more centralized? Or would you buy in three years from now when this, when it's more decentralized? Do you think the values will hold as it gets more decentralized? I think the value will increase as, as we have more interesting content on the platform. It's it, Going back to this, you know, comparing this to a city, if you were to buy a piece of land in, in, on, in Manhattan 200 years ago, it's maybe not worth a lot, but over time, as you, you have more businesses, more people, more artists coming in, uh, the, the value is very much, It's the, the value of the land itself is, is nothing. It's, the value comes from the economic activity that's being built on top of the land. Uh, and and this is where long term where the where the value will 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 rise. So right now you can buy a 2.5 acre piece of land for maybe I think it's fifteen hundred dollars. So that's not very expensive if you compare it to the physical world, obviously. Uh, and and I think as time goes by, this this will increase if you create an economic activity. But it's really hard to predict. And then you know back to the zoning thing. What happens if you buy that and all of a sudden the neighborhood is all strip bars or you know pick 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 so pick yeah no yeah we, we we still have terms of use so right now we don't allow gambling we don't allow adult you know uh entertainment and this kind of thing so we want to provide a good balance between uh providing a safe environment for everyone to to be in and and and, and you know freedom or uh, the ability to also be an entrepreneur and build what you want to build so it's it's in between so the governance is still halfway. You you would if it, if zero is totally centralized and ten is totally decentralized. You think you're at five or three? Maybe depends on what how you uh, what angles you look at. But maybe overall, maybe yeah, maybe something like this. Yeah, and okay. towards, tending towards you know maybe seven, eight, nine. I mean, it's it's hard to be a hundred percent you know at ten, but I think we're going there. Okay, I mean it's it's really interesting. I had a conversation with Kathleen, one of the owners of Tezos years ago and was at a round table with her and um she's oh we're completely decentralized i said so who's the largest token holder she goes well my husband and i and i thought how many tokens do you have she goes we have about 85 percent i said well that's not very decentralized yes. right unless they sold those off and i think they are but they had again they had a foundation the same type of structures yeah. and it was just interesting that they considered themselves and they talked about it as decentralized but in reality, practical terms, they were in full control by a long shot. Yeah, probably. I mean, I don't know the structure of Tezos anymore, but uh, probably less less today. Yes, they, they've been they've well, gone through some things. Yeah, even Bitcoin was fully decentralized. You know, Satoshi Nakamoto it was the only one at the beginning, and then he get more people, and now it's fully decentralized. I think it's the best example of a decentralized ecosystem. It seems to be working. It seems yeah. to be secure. Um, yeah. No one's questioning the, the strength or the robustness of the token, um, but they're also not building on it, right? It's, it's, Bitcoin is, it's different than Ethereum where there are no smart contracts, obviously, and you cannot do the things you're doing um, where you guys are. It's, it's really interesting space. So what do you think about your competitors? Do you, do you look at Decentraland? Do you look at Meta? Are you, are you concerned what they're going? Are you guys in parallel? Are you in conflict? How do you see that? So we, we we like all our web three competitors. We wish them success because you know the interoperability nature of the metaverse. We want them to grow, and and by them growing and being interoperable with us, it's going to make us grow as well. Uh, as for web two companies, I mean, I really hope we're not going to end up in a world where we have one company uh, controlling the metaverse. You may have seen this movie, uh, Ready Player One, you know, from a few years ago by yeah. Steven Spielberg, and. I think it's a it's a, it's a terrible dystopian nightmare where we live in those townships and and people put a helmet and they live in this world controlled by one company. So I really hope that it's going to be multiple uh, metaverse, you know, working together. That's going to be better for everybody. But do you talk to them? Do you are you communicating with them? Are yeah, we really yeah yeah we talk to them. You know, we would contact with them, uh, 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 especially Web three or other Web three companies. Web two not so much. Web2, they operate in silo, they're bigger than us, uh, uh, so they do their own thing, but Web2 companies all the time. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the Upland guys. Um, they seem to have a lot of investment, actually, and, and their model's a little bit different. They're geo-mapping actual property and actual yeah. you know streets and things. What do you think about that model? I think it's interesting. I think it's, it's you know, in this phase where you have a lot of innovation, 
uh, and it's hard to know who's going to come on top. So I think it's great that people try different things. Uh, and if it works, you know, we'll learn from them and, and uh, you know, see what we do with it. And then, because I'm going to ask Dirk and, and Danny Brown-Wolf is on the panel with us as well. Um, Rights-wise, you know, and, and I, I want to say it applies mostly to Upland at this point because you live in a, you know, a physical house, say, in West L.A., West Hollywood, and it has an address. Does that property ownership also include metaverse rights, right? And I don't know that that's been tested yet, but I know that if I'm trying to buy a property in Upland, it could be owned by somebody completely different than the actual physical property owner. Are you uh, yeah, that, yeah, that I don't know. I mean, in, in, our, in our case, everything is an NFT, including the land. So yep. if you buy the land inside the sandbox, it shows and nothing we can do really to uh, take it away from you or you can do whatever is is doable on on the land can somebody fractionalize that ownership uh not directly they could probably do it indirectly or but it's it's not built in the platform okay but what about a building if someone owns the land which is just like in physical terms mm -hmm. somebody can own the land and another company could build the building and operate yeah. the business yeah. on top of it is that yeah. possible it will be possible. We, we, it's not yet feasible, but we're building the the ability to lend or to rent part of your land and rent to somebody else, and and uh, you know, built in the smart contract. But it's not there yet, but it's coming. And then taxes are there? Are there any considerations for taxes right now, or no? Not yet. We thought about this, uh, but we don't have any taxes. <laughs> and that I'm assuming would be a governance issue. I'm, I'm assuming you can't just roll in one day and say, hey, everybody, it's a $10 a day tax. You're all yeah. going to pay it or you're gone, right? So there must be some type of representation from the property owners. I mean, right now we don't have this. So, uh, uh, but it's an interesting discussion, you know, like in, in, for example, in New York, you pay taxes on on not only what you have, but also the, the business you could have. So the, the, the taxes, the property taxes in New York for for, for commercial is it really they incentivize you to really build a business and to make sure you you make money and uh, they have air rights in new york right i mean they yes exactly well, you yeah, own yeah. the airspace above your building and can sell yeah. it yeah i'm assuming in the sandbox there's no limit to how far that air right goes right no we we have a limit of how far you can build oh you do uh yeah yeah we do i don't i don't remember exactly the limit but we do have a limit yeah what about companies exceeding their reach so so you've got Warner Brothers, Atari, I'm assuming companies might want to influence neighboring parcels, other people with on the, within the platform. Is there any way to police that? Or is, is it all again going to be decentralized through an HOA or like a governance board? Or how does it, how do you, how do you envision enforcing some of the boundaries that you may have to put in place? Uh, it, it's going to be done through, through the, the, the community, not through us. Uh, right now, I think it would be very hard for even a big landowner to influence who's coming next to them, uh, outside of them buying it for you know and making sure uh, that we sell it to whoever they want. But other than that, you know anyone can buy a piece of land next to Warner Music or to uh, Snoop Dogg or others. How did, how did the deal happen with Snoop? Was he early? I, th I know he has properties on other platforms as well, but did he contact you guys directly, or did he buy it as a consumer? What what happened in that deal? uh i don't know i mean I, it was before i before i joined the company but uh, i can tell you that snoop is really into he's very good at you know spotting new consumer trends and he likes new technology and and very early on there was a very good match between between uh between him and, and the sandbox we like him he likes us so there was a very good match and if he wants to do a concert on his property are there restrictions or he could just do that and invite whoever he would like or do the neighbors have a say or what happens in that instance? No, you could do whatever he wants on the property. Actually, we sold a, a ticket for a Snoop Dogg concert uh, and it's coming soon. So uh, uh, it's it's going to be very interesting. So he's going to do a concert on his property? Yes. <laughs> interesting, because that happens all the time in, in, you know, like you said, Fort, Fortnite and, and Nine, Roblox. Roblox. Yeah. Yep. And I'm trying to figure out, and my background's in music, I'm trying to figure out how that translates into the sandbox, right? How do you get those eyeballs to come in? Because I know 
Decentraland is, a, I, I've attended events there where you have to open, you bring your wallet. I mean, I'm assuming it's the same thing. You have to have a, a Meta wallet or MetaMask at some point, it's an NFT storage device, right? And then is it still very, I'm just wondering when it gets easier for average consumers to say, hey, I just want to go see this show. I don't really want to attach yeah. all my wallets and transfer a bunch of tokens. Yeah, you, it's, I mean, we're working very hard to make it easier. We know it, we, there is still too much friction for, for ordinary users. Uh, this, I think it's a problem for the whole industry and we have to do a better job at this. And I can tell you that we're spending a huge amount of time and resources trying to make it easier. Uh, so it's getting better all the time. It's, we're not, you know, we're still still some kind of friction, but we are we are getting better every day. Are you guys, I'm assuming there's, you said there's no foundation yet, but are you encouraging partnerships with third parties? Are you buying other companies? Are you, how are you, how are you attracting developers and others to build in the ways that you want to go? Are you doing that in-house? Or are you bringing in third parties to do that? Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, at the end of the day, we are a th- uh, two-sided marketplace between content creators on the one hand and, and users and players on the other. So we want these to be organic, you know, and, and uh, uh, we have, I think, 250 studio builders who can, if you're a brand, uh, if you want, if you don't know how to build something for the sandbox, you can contact contact one of those companies, and they will happily work with you. Um, and sometimes we do it ourselves. So we initiate the contact, or the big brands come to us, and we have a special partnership. But the vast majority of the content being built on the sandbox is built by the companies themselves or the individuals themselves. Sometimes with the help of uh, studio builders. What do you do about the value of the token? Because I think your token's tradable on, on any exchange, right? I mean, I, yeah. I think I see it in Coinbase. What's yeah. Does that influence anything? Or you have no, I mean, I'm assuming you have no control over the valuation. But no, what we have that, no control, yeah. What does that we do? We wish. No, we <laughs> wish, but we, we don't. You know, it's, uh, it's just uh, supply and demand. Is there a limited number of tokens? Yeah, we have, uh, we have uh, 3 billion tokens uh by design part of the smart contract i think we've released 1.4 or 1.5 so far so not everything has been released but it's coming and then when it's done it's done it's like the we have a finite amount of land we have a finite yeah exactly we have a finite amount of sand and that's again controlled by governance i'm and i'm going to bet you're going to control you're not going to let it go fully decentralized until all that stuff has been released. No, it's it's not that. It's just the decentralization is a process that takes time, and and uh, we're putting it in place and and um, a step by step. Are you doing it with traditional DAO structure, or are you following some other protocol? I think I mean I can't disclose what it's going to be, but I think uh, decentralized autonomous organization are very interesting. Uh, a lot of companies actually they have a mix between a foundation and a DAO. So I, we'll see. Uh, uh, we're working on it. And the company's based where, corporate-wise? So the, the mother company is basically out of Hong Kong uh, because we were a spin-off of another company called Animoca. Animoca is the biggest uh, uh, crypto gaming company in the world. So uh, they're based in Hong Kong. But we have offices. We have about a bit less than 500 people around the world. Uh, here in Los Angeles, we're growing very fast. Uh, we have offices in South America, in Europe, in London. Seoul, Japan, a bit everywhere. Wow. And most of your users, do you think, are North American or European? Where, where do you find them? Asian? No, I mean, the, our number, our biggest country is by far the US uh, in terms of users, not so monetization. Uh, then I would say tier two is English speaking countries in Western Europe, UK, France, Germany, Canada. Uh, and then we have Brazil, Seoul as well. Korea is very big, Japan. Interesting. I, I always wondered how that would be language wise, right? If if you're all of a sudden you have 166,000 parcels, they're all bought up by English speakers. If you don't speak English, I suppose you can market to them just like New York. There's a lot of different neighborhoods and areas yeah. where Chinatown, Little Italy, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm, I'm supposing it's interesting. I, the more I see Web3 coming about, it's almost like a universal language may come out of this, right? And maybe, 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 yeah, yeah. Maybe it's not exactly English, but maybe it's English that's got different variations so that it's understandable in different places because commercially, well, also you've got the advantage of having individual lenses, right? If I'm speaking Portuguese, 
I could probably set a setting on my avatar to see everything translated in real time to Portuguese. Yeah, right? I, th I think it's coming, you know, uh, um, uh, and I've, I've seen demos of it already in, in other platforms uh, yeah, where you can automatically translate, I, I, you know, give it a few years and it's going to be there for everybody. It's yeah. I mean, it's already happening with devices. I was in Brazil and yeah. trying to read a, a Portuguese menu and you just hold up your phone and it translates almost in real time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the hardware? I mean, how limiting is that? To me, there's, you know, Meta obviously seems to control that market, but do you see other players jumping in? I think Apple's going to have a headset coming out at some point, but is that limiting? Do you have to partner with one of the big makers or how does that work with you guys? So our view is that the, the metaverse should also be a multi-platform experience. And, and uh, right now the sandbox is available only on your, on your PC or your Mac. The next step for us is your mobile device. And then maybe, you know, a few years from now, we'll, we'll, we will probably pull the sandbox into a, a VR or AR environment. Uh, and, and we really think that it shouldn't just be a, a VR uh, content. I, th I think, I, th I hope it's going to be multi-platform so that people can experience the, the metaverse uh, um, depending on, you know, where they are or what they need at one point. So, um, uh, and I think you see that the, the VR devices the hardware is is finally taking off you know it's been it's been coming two years from now forever and now it's i think it's finally taking off i think the oculus from from facebook is uh is doing very well still small but it's growing nicely and i've heard the same rumors as you i think apple is going to come soon in this space so i think you know i believe you can see the vr and maybe the ar market taking off sometimes 24 or 25 something like that yeah, I, I sometimes I look and think AR is a stepping stone into full VR because it's it's easier to use in real life. Right now, the hardware is less bulky and less you know intrusive, um, and I think it's it probably has a more immediate use case in real life. If you're driving, if you're commuting, if you're doing something where you have to deal with brick and mortar versus being completely immersed in VR. Um, yeah. But it's yeah, I mean, I, I saw the new Oculus or Meta. Quest, it's you know it's still sixteen hundred dollars, which yeah is more than more than a computer might cost. So it's it's not exactly accessible yet. Um, but I I I do think you know once someone makes a breakthrough with a low cost, accessible, robust headset, that will change the game. And I think it's going to come around the same time as yeah, like you're I saying, do. where a lot of things, a lot of the other feature sets come up. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, what would you say to anybody that was looking at different lands to, to invest in parcels? Would you buy across each land and just figure out where you're at? Like would stocks be diversified or would you put more stock in the sandbox or what's, what would be a strategy for someone there? I think it, maybe it's wise to invest in different companies. Um, uh, and I, you know, I'm not a financial advisor disclosure i, I really can't, can't tell you're what, biased what, what to do and also i'm biased so i think i think people can guess where where i would invest um uh but i think you know it's, it's do your research you know uh, uh try different metaverse and, and see which one you like and then maybe invest in it and there's no exclusive deals like you're not cutting a deal with snoop saying you have to be on the sandbox no. he could be in the central and he could be anywhere so i'm assuming no, we don't no. most of the corporations are also going to want to be in as many places as possible. Um, yeah. And it's, it's good for us. Creates more value for everybody. Of course. So and I think it- encourage this. Yeah, yeah it, it, it widens the marketplace. It brings in more value if you're bringing in a more diverse group and you're seeing, you might see a performance from Snoop does better in the sandbox than it does in Upland or wherever he might perform. And there'll be a reason for that, right? And like you said, if you specialize in certain verticals, maybe sandbox becomes the retail place or becomes the entertainment place or whatever that might be. Um, I think some of that's going to shake out as well. Um, I'm noticing that in the central land where, you know, they, they're promoting certain lands and then there's certain people that are building almost parallel lands that they have to promote themselves. It's a, uh, it's still not yeah, also, centralized. No, but we have a vested interest. So take the example of, of Snoop Dogg. We, our interest is that we, we made a collection of 10,000 Snoop Dogg avatars we've got in the doggies. So, the more the it's it's also interesting for us for those doggies to be interoperable and work with other platforms, 
it means it has value. So more people will come and buy them as well. So the more the more open it is, I think the more value we create. I think that's right. It's it's like what happened in crypto, right? You you see the sushis and the Uniswaps because everybody had their own token and you couldn't exchange them without selling, buying, paying the fees and, and having multiple accounts and multiple wallets. And it was, it got to the point where it's just to get something was, was arduous. And yeah. someone said, let's wrap something or let's put something in Uniswap where you could just buy across token to token versus having to convert and then convert back. And I think you're right. Something like that's going to happen here where the, tr the interoperability, the cross-platform stuff um, I do think they're going to sort out into definite, unique platforms, like maybe Decentraland's focused on sports and you're focused on entertainment. I mean, whatever those verticals might be, I think someone will specialize in them up front. And I think a lot of the traffic initially will start going that way. Um, but I still think we're so early. I mean, <laughs> there's so many, so many opportunities from retail, um, so many opportunities from just real estate itself and brands are just learning about this space. I see fashion's way ahead, right? You're seeing Balenciaga mm -hmm. and yeah. Ralph Lauren and Gucci, everybody's jumped in and building um, in areas that really, I wanna say, aren't so contextual. Um, one of the things that we're doing is an entertainment project um, with the Sunset Strip. And we think that that's a very music centric space. And I'm in conversations with a lot of rights holders that are brands that you would know and I'm saying you could build a store in the middle of Decentraland, but why would someone go to that store? Whereas if they're a music fan and they know they're going to see a, their favorite artist, they're going to eat dinner at a very famous music restaurant, or they're going to go to a bar, or they're going to walk down the street with their friends, they're more apt to be into what you have if it's contextually relevant instead of, oh, there's a hardware store and a car lot and a clothing store. It's like if, if it's that disjointed sometimes, it's not a, it's not a, the, the the actual experience isn't so cohesive for someone. And I liken it to, to auto malls, right? And here you go buy a car, there's four dealerships, 10 dealerships, 20 dealerships all next to each other because they know someone's looking for a car and they don't want to drive here to look at Toyota and drive over there to look at BMW and drive to the other side of town to look at Mercedes. They'd rather have all the competitors lined up so that you can just walk from one to the next and buy your car in a night. Um, yeah. yeah. I think there's some value to that, but uh, interesting stuff. I, I, I'm i curious as to where you think this goes in the next three or four years. Do you think the growth is happening in that period or you think it's going to be further out or, or sooner? No, I think I think the growth in, in our case is already happening. We have a, a really very, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's exponential growth. Uh, and and we're starting, you know, we're starting small, but it's, it's growing really nicely and uh i think i think it's it's already there people are ready um and uh hopefully we know in three years from now we'll be much much bigger i don't know when we're going to catch up with the the web two guys uh maybe five years from now who knows is there marketing do you guys actively market or sell i mean i i don't i see some things i don't know if it's just users pushing that or if it's actually coming from from your 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 company we do a little bit for now i think we plan to do more uh, and the fact that we partner with big brands is also part of this. I mean, we we partner with Gucci, we partner with Adidas, with Warner Music, with Snoop Dogg, and many, many others. So it's also part of a marketing campaign in a way. And when you partner with them, what is, does that mean that there's an arrangement or does that just mean they bought space and they're doing their own thing or there's a concerted effort to work together? So sometimes there is a concerted effort to work together. Uh, that's the case for Gucci and all the names I just mentioned. So in those cases, we build the experience in uh -huh. cooperation with those guys. Uh, but the, most of the time, they, they do it themselves. But sometimes, you know, we, we work together. It's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Interesting. I, I think that's, you have to do that to prime the pump, right? If you don't start with those relationships and help nurture that and, and build that, it's going to take even longer. Because I think a lot of artists, especially, which is where my background is, they have no clue how this works, right? They almost yeah. need someone to hold their hand and say, here's what we can do for you. Take a look at this. You know, you can bring your own tech people in, but most of them don't have, you know, yeah. a, a bunch of engineers behind them. So um, yeah. I, I think your platform is easy to use too. I mean, most of these platforms, there's no coding experience. You can just go in and design something in your, in your own stores, right? You can make something to wear, you can make something, um, a building, you can build a building there and it doesn't, I don't think it costs anything, right? 
know our <clears throat> so from a creator's perspective our tools our creators tools are entirely free you download them on our website on sandbox.game and you're right they we decided to have a no code approach so you can't code even if you wanted it <laughs> it's everything is drag and drop pull down menus check boxes using the mouse and that's it so there's no coding at all no you can't that's a big difference between us and, and web two companies okay so if i'm warner brothers i still have to check the box and drag things over versus having... even ourselves you know we make content ourselves sometimes and 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 we use our own tools and uh everything is drag and drop and you can build pretty sophisticated experiences because we build the logics and we the first step is to do what we call terraforming it's creating the buildings and the grass and the trees and the cars and the people and the likes that's drag and drop as well and and uh and the, the, the logic and creating a game game mechanic so drag and drop interesting i think that's good it's democratizing it it lets people come in with low skill sets that still want to create and be a part of a community versus having the deeper pockets to hire engineers right exactly. and, and having a team because you're right the companies come in and they build something and it's like how do how do i do that oh well that was two million dollars mm -hmm. versus someone actually building on their own um interesting times man i think i think these are exciting times i think the ability for average people in all parts of the world which i keep going back to because it's so hard when you live in los angeles or new york or london and it's you just think everybody looks and thinks and acts like you and has the resources you have but many people don't have the resources that we have but if they can access this and live i don't want to say second life but it is like second life but have a different lifestyle experience that that opens worlds up for them and connects them in ways they wouldn't have otherwise um i think that's a good thing yeah that's okay. great well, it's really good to talk to you, uh, Matthew. I appreciate you coming on today. Um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at this conference. Um, again, it's futureworlds.co. Uh, Matthew's on a 10 o'clock virtual lands panel. And let's thank him for participating in the podcast today. Great.